What's up, YouTube? Uh, there's been a lot of changes, so I figured I'd grab the camera. Uh, the most noticeable is I finally stopped being lazy and added a float valve that's connected to the water tower. And now we officially have a consistent top off. Um, and one other thing before I forget, no matter what salinity checker you are using, I personally use this HANA every day. Every day I check my salinity and my pH. That kind of, it's like checking the vitals to the doctor. If one of those are off, it kind of leads me in the direction of what went wrong. But no matter what you use, you should double check it with this once in a while. Now I'm curious to see how mine compares because I will admit I haven't double checked it with a refractometer in probably a year. <laughs> but I do recalibrate my HANA salinity checker all the time. And those are the only HANA checkers I use for the salinity and the pH. Another thing, I went to the pet store, and for some reason, I like this Green Star Apollo. I have no idea why. Um, it's kind of cool. It's green with white edges. Now, I've never wanted Green Star Apollo because it's almost a pest. It grows too fast. But even though you can't see it currently, this one was kind of a little more exclusive. You still can't tell. But the edges are white. Um, One more change. When I was at the pet store, I also found this shrimp Oh, excuse me, this brine shrimp hatchery. Now, I have another brine shrimp hatchery, but it doesn't grow as many shrimp as this one. Here, I'll show you. Guys, this is the one I used to use. Now, this thing worked great. <clears throat> you fill it up with water to the fill line. And then you put the shrimp on the outside and they can't float over this grate. So the shrimp eggs on the outside and as they hatch, they'll swim under the grate. And you'll put a light source above it so all the shrimp will swim to the center. And then you use a strainer and you just strain them out. It works great. Now this does get clogged. You have to scrub it real hard with a toothbrush to keep it clean. But it did not produce many shrimp. I mean, it produced plenty for one tank. But I don't have one tank. I have a bunch. So, <clears throat> excuse me. While I was at the pet store, I found this. You just screw a two liter bottle in it. That was a cool temperature sticker. I thought that sticker was really cool. <laughs> But the air hose just goes into the bottom, bubbles out. You put a little thing on here to adjust your bubble rate. And now the goal is when I feel like they're ready in 24, 36 hours, I will close this, click it shut, and the hatched eggs will float to the top, which is the waste. And the freshly hatched brine shrimp should go to the bottom. And then you can unhook it here and basically unclick that and squirt all your live shrimp into a cup. And after they come out, you click it shut, reconnect it, and you got all your hatched shrimp. I haven't done it yet. I'm getting ready to. Um, so I think it's going to work right. And it'll produce a lot more shrimp than my other method, but they're both great. Now, this new coral that I got, when I brought it home, it was covered, it was on a giant rock. 
I end up c cutting it all away with bone cutters. Had lots of sponge and crap on it. And when I dipped it in better. I always dip my new corals in better. And this gigantic worm started hanging out the top. Almost looked like a bristle worm, but it wasn't. It had these large antennas. And you could tell it was something a little more aggressive. It wasn't simply a detritivore. It almost looked carnivorous. So I put extra bear in that dip. I couldn't get it out because you don't want to pull it and rip it in half. So after I dipped it, rinsed off fresh water a couple times, not fresh salt water, I placed it in this tank. I was too scared to put it in my tanks with other corals after seeing that worm. So I put it in here. Well, the next day I came out and the worm was half hanging out of the rock. And it was unresponsive, like the pesticides finally kicked in and started killing it. So I slowly tugged on it, and it eventually came out. I did rip it in half, but I got the whole thing out in two pieces. So now I'm just kind of watching it to see if any other goodies decide to pop out. And I believe there is a little bit more orangish sponge on the bottom. So I'm probably going to have to pull it off and cut some more. Sometimes if I can't cut it off, I'll just super glue it over the top of it and smother it out. But I did add snails in here. There's one big turbo and like two or three ash areas. Um, I did not test the chemistry. I kind of threw this coral in here on a whim. So I did a, probably about a 30% water change real quick. I took 30% out and replaced it with water out of this system. So I have no idea what the chemistry is, but the star polyps don't seem to care and the snails don't seem to care. I will have to do some tests though to be safe. The tank also needs a fish. And these star polyps are gonna come out. They're not, it's not their permanent home. Unless you guys want it to be. Um, there's a couple more changes. Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. The pH on this system is low. It started off pretty high, but that was probably the freshly mixed salt water. The pH is always high on that. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of calc water, so I'm not running fully saturated calcwasser solution in this one water tower. Those two that go to all these smaller tanks, fully saturated. This one, this large system over here, there's two little tanks, this 40 gallon breeder and the 100 gallon sump, all connect into that one. And the alkalinity got up to like 13 and just would not come down. There wasn't enough corals in the system to consume the elements. So I started cutting that back extremely. It's probably two thirds water and one third calcwasser solution in that tower. And that's also the tower connecting to this. So there's not much calcwasser going in here at all. So the pH is kind of low. Normally I run a skimmer that helps raise my pH, especially if you hook a snorkel up to it, an air hose, and run it out your window. <laughs> yeah, it's messy, but we got hoses going out the window. Now you gotta make sure your hose is thick enough that does not constrict your airflow. You can kill your skimmer performance if your air hose is not big enough. Running the snorkel out the window can help raise your pH. And another day, I'm going to have to go into this mad scientist. This chaos is going on down here. It started off as an experiment. And it has evolved. This is probably the third iteration of it. More specifically, that little container there. It's the third iteration of that. This is all to keep my pH high. 
in the winter time, I have gas heat, my pH plummets. I had to come up with a solution. Calc Wasser was not enough to keep it satisfactory for me. So I came up with this. And this does the trick. There's some other things like potassium hydroxide, but I don't use those. If I use any potassium hydroxide, it's simply to raise my potassium levels. But it's too dangerous. It'll hurt you, it'll hurt your fish. It's just not good stuff to mess with. But this here, it started off not very cost efficient, but as I've modified it, it is now very cost efficient. It barely costs me anything to run this. So basically, I suck outside air into the container. It goes through this media reactors that are full of CO2 scrubbing media. And that takes all the CO2 out of the air, raising my pH. I'll make a whole video on that one day. So basically, when the calc washer is not enough, I rely on that little science experiment to raise my pH. I will hook it up to the skimmer, or this tank don't have a skimmer. So in this case, I'm going to hook it up to an air bubbler. Doesn't work as good as a skimmer, but still works good. So <clears throat> we're going to use, I love these Lee's wooden diffusers. Now they don't last forever, but they are great. Lee's also makes the tiniest little check valve I've ever seen in my life. It's cool. And we're going to need a valve. We're going to need a suction cup. Now I got, you probably cannot see. And it's probably dirty back here. But I got this crazy air pump back here. And it's got all these. It came with this bar of valves. So I got airlines running everywhere. And now I picked this one off Amazon. Because I can hook a hose up to the back. And that hose also runs out the window to snorkel. So the air pump's pulling fresh air from outside. That which goes through the CO2 scrub media. And then it's going to go to the tank. And I'm about to hook this up. So we got the air pump pulling fresh air. The fresh air is coming from outside, going through the CO2 media scrubber, through the air pump, and it's going to go in this tank. And it's going to raise my pH from 7.8 to at least 8.0. My goal is not to have the highest pH I can get, but to have my pH never go below 8. If it does go below 8, you're still fine. I can grow corals with 7.8 pH. I mean, star pups doing fine. But corals are happier, more colorful. They're hardier if your pH never goes below 8. So it don't really matter what, how high you get during the day, as long as at night, it don't dip below 8. Completely changes everything for you. So we're going to add the air bubbler. And we're going to try to harvest our shrimp. And we're going to double check our salinity with our refractometer. And that's kind of the chore list for the day. The only thing I've done inside the tank cleaning wise is I've scraped the glass twice since I've set this up. It was getting dirty, but the snails have pretty much cleaned everything spotless. They look brand new. I'm actually starting to worry that the snails are hungry. I don't want them to starve out and die. So if algae don't start growing, I might have to supplement some algae sheets, some nori sheets in here. I'm trying to think if there's any other updates. Man, one day I'll remember to turn this off. That kills the sound in the video.
Oh yeah, here's an update. We got a green plate coral. Oh, can't really see him. Yeah. But green's not the most rare plate coral. But this one was very bright green. That's a good one to propagate. It was very healthy. That's the key. When you get plate corals, nine times out of ten, they are not healthy. They're super stressed. You can bring them back, but I would never recommend a plate coral for a beginner hobbyist just because they don't come in healthy. Now, if you can find somebody that's propagating them and they do look healthy, grab one. It'll probably live. It'll probably do great. Since this one is healthy, I will probably be able to propagate it fairly soon. Uh, we moved a lot of coils out of here. We tried to get all the SPS out. We moved a lot of coils out of here too. I've been trying to collect all my random SPS frags. And we've been trying to toss all the random SPS frags in this tank. We're going to see how it goes. But before I put them all in, I want to make sure that they're going to like it. We got two wave makers in the back, so we can really crank up the flow on them. The goal is to make this a high light, high flow tank. I put a bigger light on it. It's not needed. It's going to be turned way down, but I wanted very good spread. I didn't want shadows. So I'm going to slowly turn that light up. Mushrooms are doing great. <clears throat> Always are. That is the coolest fish. Let's see if he hides one. My favorite fish that I own, the Fiji Devil. He's amazing. He's fat though. He's a chubby little fish. He must just eat worms and coat pods all day. Cause I don't feed him enough to get fat, and he is fat. <clears throat> oh, look, the snoop. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Nazareth, Nazor. I don't know. These snails are slightly carnivorous. They come out every time I feed live food, and they try to get snacks. But they're great. They stir up your sand bed because they hide under the sand. You'll see that little snorkel hanging out. They're great snails. Never had one. I suggest get them, but only if you have a sand bed. They need a sand bed, in my opinion. It's still a little dirty from turning up the light. Cyano on the sand bed. But as the system adjusts to me turning up the lights too fast, that will all go away. Um... I hate when they do this, but all my favorite anemones always go to the glass so you can't see them. But we got this one because it was like the most, I've never seen a anem flower anemone this color pattern. It was just yellow and green, but it is like neon green and green or yellow and green. But the way it's striped, oh, I've never seen one like this. That's probably my favorite one right now. I wish I'd get a better picture of it. Look at that guy. That's just incredible. If you never had a flower anemone, how does just buy one? I have a million babies in here because after about a year and a half, mine started spawning. I believe it's that yellow one and that orange one. There's another one hiding back there. But once these babies get bigger, I'm going to try my hand in cutting them. They say you cannot cut a flower anemone, but I'm going to try. Because by braiding them, I can't pick which colors I want. So in order to propagate like this crazy rainbow one or this brand new yellow green one, 
I would have to be able to cut them. So I'm going to try it. I'm just not going to use any of my exclusive ones. I'm going to use the ones that I farmed. Snail still cruising looking for snacks. Yeah, it's kind of a little update. This tank's doing pretty good now. I was in here cleaning the glass, so some of the zealots might be closed. But they were all open wide this morning. This ain't all the zealots we got. We got millions of zealots. Most of them are down the sump, so I don't really care for zealots. Now basically, you unhook it, and you got this white clicker here stopping it. So when I let this go, all the shrimp that sank to the bottom should blow out and come into my cup due to gravity. Now, I've learned a couple lessons already. One, when I had the light on, the shrimp would not swim to the bottom. They are going to the top. So now that puts some thoughts in my head because right now i can't get all the shrimp to the bottom most of them are down there but we still have some free swimmers and that's not really acceptable for me so i think if i would have kept the wrapper on the two liter bottle to block out the light up top that would have greatly helped but let's see if it works Oh, wow. Wow, I came fast. That appeared to be most of them. Now, again, I have too much light pollution, so my shrimp aren't going to the bottom. So I'm going to let it settle again. And I'll have to drain it one more time. But for demonstration purposes, it worked pretty well. There is a lot, I don't know the best way to show you, but there is a ton of shrimp in here. Way more than I was getting out of the other shrimp hatchery. And there's still a lot in the bottle. I'm going to have to let it settle and drain again. But all in all, this hatchery is a thumbs up for me. One more update on the lagoon tank called the Aptasia update. Man, I quarantined so hard, I never thought this day would happen, except for in my quarantine tank, but never in my display. Now again, it's dirty because I'm turning up the light. It'll probably be gone next week or so. But all the Aptasias have found the flower garden. I super glued over. I came to the conclusion that the Aptasia problem is so vast, I called it too late, and they're everywhere in the display tank. I can't find any in my sump, and I'm not sure about the piping. Now, I could go extreme. 
I can shut the system down, cut the pipes off, put new pipes in, search everything and make sure there's no more aphasia. But I'm not that concerned about it. Because this is not a frag tank. This is just a display tank. So I'm taking the path of gluing over top of them. And I like that because it smothers them and I feel like there's less of a chance of them spreading through the tank. If you get a natural predator to eat them, like a foul fish or a copper band butterfly or nudie bronx, they'll eat them, then they'll poop them out, and they will spread them in your tank. So that is a last resort. Once you know that your problem is too big for you to control, then find a natural predator to eat them. But once you take that route, it's pretty much game over, and you have to accept your problem. I'm not there yet. I'm still going to try and manage it myself. Now I found some very large aptasias back there. I glued over them. And they pretty much all gone, except for one. So currently I can only find one aptasia in the whole system. And I'm gonna get in there and super glue that. I just have to keep watching. I have to keep looking with a flashlight. I take a high powered LED flashlight and I look in here when the lights are on and when the lights are off. And every time I find one, I will super glue it. I don't care about ugly super glue spots all over my tank because in a few weeks you won't even notice them. But that's a little update on that battle. I feel like I'm getting the upper hand. <laughs> but most likely not. We got our air bubbler in there doing great. I'm curious. It's only been in there for. air bubbler has only been in here I don't know about 20 minutes and the pH went from 7.8 to 7.9 now that could have been a 0.1 jump or that could have been a 0.9 jump I do not know and as the day goes on your pH rises anyway so this might not have anything to do with the air bubbler but I do expect the air bubbler to raise it at least 0.2 so 7.8 I think my lowest will be 8.0 and during peak hours during the day it was probably 8.0 before the air bubbler so now I'm hoping it will go to 8.2 during the day I have a blue striped file fish in this aquarium it's very small I've had him for a while it's kind of cryptic now I can find him but he's so hard to get to show up on my camera because he is kind of small. And there's also a war paint clown goby in here. He's a green one with the red stripes over his eyes. He's kind of cryptic too. He's hollowed out a hole inside the Space Invader chalice. The chalice is kind of growing around him. He's got a cave in there. But both those fish love brine shrimp. So I always put them in here first. Give them a nice splash. That hatchery is amazing. I would have got, I wouldn't even got that many out of the other hatchery. But the damsel sees them. <laughs> Going nuts. I think that hermit crab seen him. <laughs> he started groaning. I was wondering if that would entice the foul fish to come out. He lives in that cave. Well, let's try this one. This one has fire shrimp. Let's turn some white light on. This has some yellow gobies, fire shrimp. Up, up, up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, they see them. Yeah, it takes them a second. They get excited.
<laughs> they'll start swimming all around the house and then things. Oh, look, our shrimp even got excited. He's running around looking. Let me see. This one we have a damsel and a dotty back. Oh, there he is. Where'd you go? Yeah, <laughs> it took off. Okay, we need white light. Can't see anybody. <laughs> Damsel's tearing them up. That little guy is too. He just hides under the rack. There he is. He's cool. I get some clowns. Oh my goodness, clowns. These guys are aggressive. We'll get a fat boy some. Might be a girl. I don't know. <laughs> Let's get some naked clowns. Anemones are probably like these. Royal Grandma likes them. I may have never offered these to some of these fish, so they might just be learning what they are. A lot of these fish are captive bred. We got some fish down here. Wow, we still got a bunch left. Almost forgot. There's no fish, but it will make a healthy ecology. Put a tiny little splash in there. 